Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In 1927, Edwin Perkins sat in his mother's kitchen in Hastings, Nebraska, trying to figure out how to solve the dilemma that was bringing down his most popular product, a fruit-flavored drink called Fruit Smack. Edwin had grown up working in his family's general store and now had a mail-order business with over 100 products but Fruit Smack had created a big headache for Edwin. The product had to be delivered by his employees door to door because it was sold in heavy glass bottles that broke easily and would leak. However, Edwin's eureka moment came when he recalled the Jell-O packets he encouraged his father to buy for their store when he was a child. He knew that if he could do the same thing for his fruit drink, his problems would be solved. Edwin developed a method to remove the liquid from Fruit Smack, leaving just a powder packaged in an envelope. He gave the drink a new name, Kool-Aid, and by 1934, the product was such a hit that the Perkins Company began to also make and distribute it overseas. In 1953, General Foods purchased Kool-Aid from Edwin and began to develop more flavors and pre-sweetened mixes. The drink was extremely popular and had a great marketing scheme directed at children. So it is understandable that Kool-Aid was upset when the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid, became a part of the American lexicon. But when you understand why the phrase was coined, it was even more understandable. After all, it was really their competitor, Flavor Aid, that was mixed with cyanide and contributed to the mass suicide of over 900 people. But I can say now, don't drink the Kool-Aid, about the drink's culpability. There was only one thing to blame, and it was not a children's drink. It was a man named Jim Jones. As a Killer Psyche listener, you'll love Audible's new pulse-pounding collection of exclusive thrillers that are guaranteed to keep you on the edge of your seat. With captivating sound design, eerie soundscapes, and dynamic performances, their titles are brought to life. I recommend The Killer Across the Table by John Douglas, my mentor at the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, and his co-author, Mark Olshacker. It is great. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance, too, with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche.
I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Jim Jones, The Jonestown Massacre. On November 15, 1978, a plane carrying California Congressman Leo Ryan and a delegation of his aides, journalists, and concerned relatives landed in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana on the South American coast. The congressman was on a fact-finding mission, investigating allegations that some 900 American citizens were being physically abused and held against their will at the People's Temple Agricultural Project in the Guyanese jungle. The People's Temple's charismatic founder, Pastor Jim Jones, had recently led his congregation from San Francisco to the remote jungle compound. They fled there to escape Jones's perceived persecution in the United States. Their church was less of a religious group than a 20-year-old socialist movement dedicated to equality, especially equality among races. And Guyana was an English-speaking socialist country that reflected their own mixed-race congregation. More importantly, the government in Guyana gave the People's Temple the freedom to build and operate its community as they saw fit. Starting in 1973, the temple leased 27,000 acres of land from the Guyanese government and began clearing it to create Jonestown, their, quote, promised land. To Jim Jones, Congressman Ryan's arrival was a personal attack. He made it clear Ryan would not be permitted entrance to Jonestown, but Ryan threatened to show up at the gates and film himself being denied access. And this would only complicate the legal problems Jones was battling in the States. So Jones's lawyer and his wife, Marceline, intervened and convinced Jones that letting the congressman in would be good publicity. After permission was granted, the delegation flew on a small chartered plane to a tiny village about six miles from Jonestown. From there, it was an hour ride over unpaved roads to the compound. That afternoon, Ryan and a handful of journalists were given a brief tour of Jonestown. With Ryan interviewing a few members whose relatives back in the United States wanted to know how they were being treated. The delegation's initial impressions were far more positive than they had anticipated. They had been told by former members and concerned relatives that they would see skeletal figures living in appalling conditions. What they observed instead was something very rugged but impressive. The settlement was composed of residential cabins, a school, a basketball court, a medical clinic, a central pavilion for meetings, and acres of farmland, all linked by a network of wooden walkways. And most settlers appeared healthy and happy, some of them telling Representative Ryan that Jonestown was the best thing that had ever happened to them. After the tour, the delegation joined the settlers for a pleasant meal under the pavilion, complete with a comedy show and live music. Yet, as the journalists watched the settlers singing, dancing, and clapping along with the music, they sensed that maybe the temple members were performing too much. The reality was, the settlers were extremely isolated. There was no television, newspapers, radio programs, telephones, or mail service. They were cut off from the outside world. 
there was only a small radio communications room that a chosen few were permitted to enter. And without money or personal property, everything was shared by the community. They questioned how settlers could voluntarily leave. The journalist's suspicions were confirmed when a man approached NBC reporter Don Harris and slipped him a folded piece of paper. Harris dropped it, and the man quickly scooped it up and pushed it back into his hands, telling him, you dropped this, sir. A child nearby saw what happened and immediately started chanting, he gave him a note, he gave him a note. Everyone, including children, were encouraged to tell on fellow members. Personal secrets were considered counter to their socialist cause. The note listed two people's names that wanted to leave. Around 10 p.m., the journalists began asking Jones about the reports of beatings, guns, and drugs. Immediately, the once festive atmosphere darkened. Jones grew defensive and sent the reporters back to Port Katuma instead of letting them spend the night at Jonestown. The next morning, the journalists returned and demanded to see inside a dormitory for elderly women. Their guide and its inhabitants refused, which made the journalists uh, suspicious. Again, Jones's lawyers intervened and the doors opened. Once inside the dormitory, the journalists saw that it was overcrowded, but clean. But there was a reasonable explanation for the cramped quarters. The compound's population had increased from 300 to over 900 settlers in less than a year. The settlers were still catching up with building projects. Unfortunately, though, The reporter's aggressive push to enter the cabin had broken down any goodwill that they had with the settlers. When the journalists got back to the pavilion, word had spread that 14 members of the congregation wanted to leave with Congressman Ryan. Someone reported that 11 others had slipped out into the jungle during the previous night's activities. Dramatic scenes of families splitting up played out in the open. One member stepped forward to leave while his hysterical wife wanted to stay. They fought openly over who was going to keep the children. Jones viewed each person's desertion as a personal affront. Unable to convince the defectors to stay, Jones started accusing them of being traitors who had never believed in the cause. Although his eyes were hidden behind dark sunglasses, the journalist noted the tension in his jaw and mouth. He was enraged. Don Harris pressed Jones with more questions about guns and corporal punishment. NBC's Bob Brown held the camera lens tightly on Jones's face. He responded to Harris's questions with, quote, all lies, my friend. When Congressman Ryan realized that there were not enough seats on the small plane waiting at the airstrip, he had his aides contact the embassy for a second aircraft. It was about 3 p.m. when Ryan told the delegation to go ahead saying he would stay another night at Jonestown in case more defectors came forward. But as Ryan spoke with Jones's lawyers, a Temple member brandishing a knife suddenly bounded toward the congressman and screamed, I am going to kill you. The attacker grabbed the congressman around the neck and pulled him to the ground. Stunned, the lawyers wrestled the man away from Ryan. The attacker cut himself in the scramble, and as a result, blood sprayed all over Ryan's shirt. Jones watched the whole thing impassively. As Ryan stood up, Jones smiled at him and asked, does this change everything? 
Shaken, Ryan decided to leave immediately with the delegation. As he climbed aboard the tractor-pulled wagon, a man named Larry Layton jumped in after him, saying he was also leaving. The other defectors immediately objected. Layton was a true Jones loyalist, and his defection looked like a ruse. They were certain he was planning something nefarious. When the group of defectors, newsmen, and politicians reached the airstrip at Port Katuma, Ryan and his aide, Jackie Spear, split the group and started boarding them into two airplanes. It was approximately 5 p.m. Ryan directed Spear to check all of the People's Temple members for weapons. Layton slipped around the other side, but was stopped by another defector. Spear lightly patted him down, but detected no weapons. As others boarded, Don Harris recorded an interview with Congressman Ryan outside the larger plane. Over Ryan's shoulder, Harris saw another tractor wagon arrive with eight to 12 armed People's Temple members on board. Harris said, I think we've got trouble. A second later, someone screamed, hit the deck. As the would-be travelers dropped, the gunmen started shooting. They fired 50 to 75 bullets, hitting the congressman and several of the reporters. As the wounded fell to the ground, the gunmen walked closer and shot the victims at point-blank range in the head. Some of the wounded escaped into the marshy swamp alongside the airstrip to hide. Others, including Representative Ryan and his aide Jackie Spear, were too gravely injured to run and hide in the jungle. Inside the smaller of the two planes, Temple Loyalist Larry Layton produced a pistol and shot two of the defectors multiple times before being disarmed. The defectors pulled him out of the plane. The pilot panicked, closed the doors, and took off. Only the pilot, the pilot of the larger damaged plane, and one of the wounded defectors were on board. As the small plane took off, the gunman retreated. The shooting attack lasted 20 minutes. Congressman Ryan, a defector from the temple, an NBC reporter and cameraman, and a photographer from the San Francisco Examiner were killed, and a number of others were wounded on the airfield outside of the larger, now pilotless, plane. The pilots in the small plane alerted authorities as they flew to Georgetown. By 6 p.m., Guyana's prime minister notified the American ambassador about the attack. Larry Layton was detained by the Guyana Defense Force soldiers who had been at the eastern end of the airstrip. When the People's Temple gunmen had started shooting, they just stood by and watched. They maintain that it was not their place to get in between Americans shooting each other. Meanwhile, back at Jonestown, a sudden heavy rainstorm hit. When it let up, the settlers were called back to the pavilion for a meeting. As Jones was recording himself, he called a white knight a term the settlers knew meant there was a sudden crisis threatening their lives. They had already rehearsed these emergencies on previous occasions. Jones told the members that Congressman Ryan had been killed, and now there was no other path for them but revolutionary suicide. This would be their last act of defiance. He reasoned, that the Guyanese forces, along with the CIA, would soon be arriving to execute everyone. By taking their own lives, it would deny their enemies any triumph over them. 
a lone woman stood up and challenged what Jones was ordering. She said that she believed in every individual's right to choose their own destiny. Other members shouted her down. The woman persisted and asked about the previous plans to move the People's Temple to Russia or Cuba. Jones sneered at the idea. No one was going to touch them now after the congressman's death. Several armed guards walked around the perimeter of the pavilion. A large fat was brought in. Sodium cyanide and a tranquilizer had been mixed into the purple flavor aid drink. And then nurses moved about with syringes filled with the liquid. As Jones spoke, the nurses began squirting the liquid into the mouths of babies and small children. While their mothers held them, they vomited and foamed at the mouth. Their bodies contorted in pain for 10 to 20 minutes before collapsing. A woman's voice shouted that there was nothing to fear. She denied that the children were experiencing pain. Jones admonished his flock for taking too much time. Next, mothers lined up to fill their paper cups and down the drink. Jones told the members that this was not suicide. The world would see that they were choosing to leave an unjust society. This was defiance in the face of their enemies. As parents fell from the poison, they collapsed on top of their children's bodies. Those who refused the grape drink were held down and injected with a syringe of cyanide. To me, that doesn't sound like suicide. It sounds like murder. And it was murder. A few of the lucky ones managed to escape into the jungle. As the hour passed, the tape ran out and stopped recording the horrific events. Then silence was all that remained of the People's Temple. Did you know that according to FBI property crime data, most home break-ins happen in broad daylight? As the days get longer this spring, protect your home with Simply Safe. Its advanced technology protects every room, window, and door of your home while cameras keep watch for suspicious activity 24-7, all for less than a dollar a day. And there's no long-term contract, ever. I love Simply Safe because it's so straightforward and easy to install. Knowing that my home is protected 24-7 gives me so much peace of mind. It's great that I can always check on my home through the app on my phone. Protect your home today. My listeners get a special 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com/psyche. That's simplysafe.com/psyche. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Do you ever wonder where all your money went? Like every single time you look at your bank account, Honestly, it's probably all those subscriptions. I felt that way too, until I got Rocket Money. Rocket Money helped me see all the subscriptions I'm paying for, and it was eye-opening. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, it all adds up so quickly. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. James Warren Jones, or Jimmy, was born in Crete, Indiana on May 13, 1931. His father, James, 
was a World War I veteran who suffered severe lung damage from mustard gas in France. He had a hard time breathing and at times walking, which affected his ability to work. His mother, Lynetta, worked in factories as the main breadwinner. Consequently, young Jimmy was often left to roam his small town unsupervised. Lynetta wore the pants in the family, literally and figuratively. Jim's mother was the rare woman in a 1930s small town with a college education and showed little interest in traditional domestic responsibilities like child rearing and housekeeping. Lynette was more preoccupied with her lack of station in life and the injustice of being denied a management role at her factory job. In her mind, rich, greedy business owners were deliberately keeping the working class poor down. These were concepts she instilled in her son, and it became the foundation for his socialist beliefs. Because of his father's inability to have a job and support the family, Lynetta worked in a local factory, a fate she was 100% certain was far, far beneath her personal ambitions. The Joneses barely got by, and other families felt sorry for them. But Lynetta wasn't exactly the sweet, friendly type whom other people enjoyed being around. She was bitter about her lot in life, being saddled with a disabled husband, a child she did not want and had no interest in caring for, and worst of all, no money. And she let everyone know it. Before Jimmy Jones was even in first grade, he learned to fend for himself. In a word, this is known as neglect. Is it as bad as abuse when it comes to how the child is affected? One would reasonably assume that no, it is not. However, according to the American Bar Association, the rate of child neglect is far, far greater than other maltreatment forms such as physical, sexual, or psychological abuse. It is a common misconception that physical abuse does greater harm to a child's health and development than neglect. It does not. Even though Jimmy was neglected, he was never totally alone without adult contact. What five-year-old Jimmy was not getting at home, he soon found he could get from a neighbor named Myrtle Kennedy, and she lived right across the street. Myrtle offered what little Jimmy needed in abundance, but was severely lacking in his own home. Attention, acceptance, nurturing, teaching, and love. She read stories to him, fed him, cared for him, and Jimmy filled as much of a void for her as she did for him. Most importantly to this story, Myrtle exposed Jimmy Jones to a world he had never known, a belief system, organized religion. Myrtle brought Jimmy with her to worship on Sundays. He became mesmerized by the whole church worshiping concept, the preaching, the communal singing, reading from the Bibles in each pew. He loved it. He wanted more of it. He wanted all of it. He could not get enough, and I mean that literally. So Jimmy started going by himself to all, and I mean all, of the other churches in town to see what they were all about, even going as far as to be baptized into them. He memorized scripture word for word and was anxious to share biblical passages with anyone that would listen. Jimmy lived for Sundays with Myrtle, and she loved him in return. He learned from Myrtle's response to him, her smiling, laughing, hugging and praising him, that religion was a powerful thing. By talking about God, he could be loved, admired, respected, and accepted. Right then and there, the seeds to his future as a man of God were planted. 
What interested Jimmy most about the church services was the sermon. When everyone in the pews was focused on and listening intently to the preacher, he was inspired by that and knew then that he wanted to be that person. He practiced sermons to other kids, sometimes standing on a tree stump looking down on his flock of five-year-olds. And sometimes he'd do it when there was no audience at all. When the neighbor kids grew tired of this really odd behavior and stopped coming to the services, Jimmy'd seek out younger kids who looked up to him. If they didn't show interest in his obsession, he'd punish them by hitting them with switches. And several townspeople recalled instances where he locked up his playmates who would not comply with his demands to participate in his ceremonies. When Jim turned 17, Lynetta left her husband. She and Jim moved to Richmond, Indiana, where he finished high school. During his senior year, he got a job as an orderly at the local hospital and began dating a nursing student named Marceline Baldwin, who was four years older than him. In 1952, Jim entered the ministry and began working at Somerset Methodist Church in Indianapolis as a student pastor. On the weekends, he drove to country areas to attend Pentecostal tent revivals, gravitating towards preachers who performed laying on of hands and healings. Soon, Jones began to preach at these services. In 1952, he and Marceline adopted a 10-year-old girl who was part Native American and also launched a campaign to build an interdenominational recreational center for youths in Indianapolis. Frustrated by the hostility to diversity he saw in Christian communities, Jim and Marceline founded their first church in 1954 and quickly attracted new members from the Indianapolis Black community. Word spread about his multiracial congregation within the Indianapolis Black community, and between that and his weekly radio sermon, his congregation began to grow. In 1956, Jones moved the congregation again to a large synagogue and renamed it the People's Temple. At this point, they were becoming less of a church and more of a socialist movement, which seemed to be okay with Jones, who by then did not believe in God because he believed that a God would never let so much inequality exist. However, the people's temple's outward trappings were still Christian. And Jones drew from his experience with Pentecostal tent revivals to perform uh, miracles, which attracted even more new followers. His services gave the impression that he was curing cancer, causing the blind to see and the crippled to walk. He began taking his ministry on the road to other cities to build up membership. In 1958, in keeping with his own messaging of a rainbow community, Jim and Marceline adopted two Korean children, a four-year-old and a two-year-old boy. Tragedy struck seven months later when their adopted daughter was killed in a car accident while traveling with church members from a service. Months later, the Joneses returned to the same orphanage and adopted another young Korean girl. The couple's only biological son, Stefan, was born in June of 1959. Weeks later, they adopted an African-American one-year-old boy and named him James Warren Jones Jr. after his new father. This marked the first time in Indiana a black child was adopted by white parents. Jones graduated from Butler University with a degree in secondary education in 1960 and four years later became an ordained minister. 
His congregation was quickly making news for its community service efforts. These included setting up and operating nursing homes for the elderly and opening a soup kitchen that served over 2,900 meals a month. These actions helped Jones get appointed as the first ever director of the Indianapolis Human Rights Commission. By 1961, Jones was taking prescription amphetamines to keep up with his grueling schedule. One day, he had a powerful vision of nuclear holocaust striking the greater Chicago area. He read an article in Esquire magazine about the nine safest places in the world to escape a thermonuclear blast and subsequent fallout. Top of the list were Eureka, California and a small town in Brazil. In 1965, about 140 members followed him to Ukiah, about 40 miles south of Eureka in the Redwood Valley. Marceline, who was a nurse, had the idea to open up a corporation to take over management of several nursing homes. Soon, they built a sanctuary, a dormitory, and even a swimming pool. And within two years, they began tending livestock and a small crop of grapes to sell to local vineyards. According to the book, The Road to Jonestown, Jim Jones and the People's Temple by Jeff Gwynn, Initially, the all-white Ukiah community was hostile to the multiracial congregation. But Jones worked to encourage acceptance by performing constant acts of service and asking nothing in return. One of those acts was volunteering to renovate the Mendocino County Legal Aid Society offices. That was where Jones met Tim Stone the Mendocino County District Attorney. He was impressed by how the People's Temple welcomed any and all races and classes of people into their congregation. Stone joined the People's Temple in 1967. He was soon devoting his talents to the growth of the organization, rising in the ranks of the church to become one of its most important members. When he got married in 1970, Jones performed the ceremony. His much younger wife, Grace, was less enamored with Jones. But when Jones asked, she accepted a position on the People's Temple Planning Committee. In the next two years, the People's Temple established congregations in Los Angeles and San Francisco, where he ultimately moved the temple's headquarters. And his ministry grew to a couple thousand. Within the temple, everyone was encouraged to shun the materialistic trappings of clothing, cars, and personal home ownership. Members took jobs outside the community and donated 100% of their earnings back to the church. Some members signed over their homes and other significant valuables. Others turned over their social security checks. In return, they were given a $2 weekly salary, but they were provided everything they needed. But there were demands on members to attend services several times a week, and they could last for hours. Like when he was young, if Jones thought a member was not paying attention during his long services, They were called out and publicly excoriated. Other minor infractions, like disagreeing with temple policy, could result in getting publicly hit with a belt. Later, it became a paddle and then a board. Some people were struck up to 100 times. Another punishment for falling into disfavor with Jones was impromptu boxing matches. Jones would make a member fight multiple opponents until they collapsed. In addition to the disturbing physical abuse, there was a glaring fundamental issue with the temple's declared mission. The membership of the People's Temple was 70% Black, and the remaining 30% was mostly white. 
everyone was supposed to be equal, yet the planning committee was all white. Another thing that Jones preached was that all of your personal desires, including your sexual orientation, were just selfish distractions from their revolutionary calling. But Jones, he was not abstinent. In fact, he carried on multiple affairs with several temple members. He even fathered a child in 1975 with his longtime mistress, Carolyn Layton. When his wife Marceline became despondent over his infidelities and threatened to leave him, Jones convinced their children to side with him. Not wanting to lose her children, she backed down. When Grace Stone gave birth to a son in 1972, Jones made Tim, remember him, the attorney, sign an affidavit that Jones was the biological father. He signed it, but both Tim and Grace swore the child was not Jones's. Perhaps Tim thought the document was not legally binding and signed it to appease Jones's ego. The affidavit request was not out of character. Jones regularly convinced members to sign blank sheets of paper as a loyalty test. He told them if they ever left or spoke ill of the temple, he would write confessions of theft, embezzlement, rape, robbery, pedophilia, etc. above their signatures. When, in September of 1972, an eight-part series of articles that documented allegations of physical abuse, financial misdeeds, and phony faith healing appeared in the San Francisco Examiner, Jones was, uh, rattled. He convinced the planning committee that the People's Temple was under attack purely for their socialist beliefs and they needed an escape plan. That helped Jones secure the church board's permission to establish the community of Jonestown in Guyana. And yes, the town was named after Jim Jones. Meanwhile, Jones's use of methamphetamines increased. Because of that, his behavior became increasingly more bizarre and he became more paranoid. Everywhere he went, he had bodyguards with him and he wore sunglasses at all times, even inside. And the Redwood Valley compound became militarized with nightlights and armed patrols. Jones railed against the CIA, the FBI, what he termed the elitist white capitalist and claimed that they intended to put the black members of their church into concentration camps and steal their children. He spoke of, quote, dying for a cause constantly. He even gave a small group of his closest congregants a drink, and he told them it was laced with poison. After they swallowed it, he revealed that it was harmless, but they had just passed his loyalty test. A year later, Grace Stone, whose son Jones had claimed as his own, defected from the People's Temple in San Francisco where she had been living. Too fearful to take her four-year-old son with her, Grace left him in the custody of the temple. Jones, who was very bitter over Grace's defection, sent the child to Guyana, possibly to keep his father, Tim, from defecting as well. In June of 1977, New West Magazine was contacted by former members and relatives of current members with stories of physical abuse and financial misdeeds. Jones fled to Guyana before the magazine article was published. His arrival immediately changed the conditions and mood at the compound. Within months, the population at Jonestown swelled from 300 to 1,200. There was not enough food or shelter to go around. 
Jones demanded that everyone surrender their passports on arrival. Of course, that made it impossible for any disappointed new arrivals to leave. Those who tried to escape were branded as traitors and they were beaten or isolated by a four by six foot underground box. Jones would rattle on over the loudspeaker day and night and recorded his sermons so they could play while he was sleeping. Everyone had to listen as they labored 11 hours a day, six days a week in the fields, kitchen, and lumber mill. Anyone who did anything that was not considered for the good of the community was either beaten or put into the isolation box. So what's at the root of Jim Jones's pathology? Quite simply, the need for power over other people. Professor of psychology, Dr. Keltner of UC Berkeley defines power as, quote, someone's capacity to alter another person's condition or state of mind by providing or withholding resources such as food, money, knowledge, affection, or administering punishment such as physical harm, job termination, or even social ostracism. And as we've discussed, those are exactly some of the tactics Jones used on his parishioners and followers. In his research of how people use power, Keltner discovered that high-powered individuals are more inclined to follow their own ideas than be influenced by others. And this is called disinhibition, and it can result in a misuse of power. Without question, I just described Jim Jones. He was not interested in anyone else's input. He was only interested in domination and control and he manipulated his followers to get him where he wanted to be as a leader. According to psychologist Kay Harari, in an article published in Psychology Today in 1992 and again in 2016, quote, he found that there was a deliberate malevolence about the way Jones treated the members of his cult that went way beyond mere perversion. It was all about forcing members to experience themselves as vulgar and despicable people who could never return to a normal life outside of the group, destroying any personal relationships that might have come ahead of the relationship each individual member had with him. It was all about terrorizing children and turning them against their parents. It was about seeing Jim Jones as an omnipotent figure who could snuff out members' lives on a whim as easily as he already snuffed out their self-respect. In short, it was all about mind control. And after that, it was not incidentally about Jones's own sick fantasies and sexual perversions. Both men and women were routinely beaten coerced into having sex with Jones in private and with other people in public. Husbands and wives were forbidden to have sex with each other, but were forced to join other members in watching their spouses being sexually humiliated and abused. In September of 1977, the San Francisco Superior Court granted Tim and Grace Stone a preliminary custody order. Several notices were nailed to the Jonestown gates. Jones offered this up as proof that the outside world was coming for their children. For six days, he told the settlers that Guyanese soldiers were about to attack and slaughter them. Panic, he ordered what he called a white knight, a mass suicide, only recalling the order when he received word from his lawyers that the order to surrender the Stone's child was delayed. Jones was continually warning his followers of danger from mercenary soldiers. 
Dozens of suicide drills, or white nights, as he called them, were rehearsed in San Francisco and in the jungle in a prelude to the final curtain he said might fall at any moment. Their deaths, Jones tried to convince them, would be honored by the world as a symbolic protest against the evils of mankind, a collective self-immolation. And this would also serve to eliminate anyone who might reveal the dirty secrets of life with the People's Temple. Jones told them the faithful would be transformed and live with him forever on another planet. And the vast majority of them believed it until their last dying breath. Or perhaps I should say until their last sip of cyanide. Can I give you a real incentive to lean into your decision to start working out and eating better? I'm Carl, co-founder of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And right now, if you sign up for a one-year subscription to Body, I want to make you an offer you can't refuse. I'll give you 65% off. Look, I know it's not easy to get fit and lose weight, especially if you're trying to figure it out by yourself, but we make it simple. Just follow a program for 20 to 30 minutes day by day and lose 5 to 10 pounds a month. We have over 120 programs that have been tested and proven to work, and almost 300,000 five-star reviews in the App Store to prove it. Body also has complete eating plans and thousands of healthy, delicious recipes. So stop guessing and start seeing results with Body, and I'll give you 65% off your annual membership right now so you save big on the app that CNN underscored named Best Fitness App. So don't wait. Sign up for a year of Body and save 65%. Just go to Body.com. That's Body with an I dot com. The next day, the Guyana Defense Force soldiers marched into the Jonestown compound and found piles of bloated bodies rapidly decomposing in the heat. Initial body counts were between 340 and 400, but after two days, the picture became much clearer and much more tragic. On November 20th, American Army volunteers arrived and discovered that beneath the first layer of bodies was another layer, and yet another. The bottom layer consisted of about 300 babies and small children whose bodies were ravaged by heat, humidity, and jungle insects. All told, 918 Americans lost their lives in the Jonestown Massacre on November 18, 1978. Investigators determined 907 died from ingesting poison. Jim Jones? Well, he had a quick and painless death. He died by a bullet to his head. It is not clear if he shot himself. The gun was found more than 25 feet away from his body. In the world of homicide investigation, that means it's highly unlikely he shot himself. Annie Moore, a young female loyalist who had served on the planning commission, also died of a gunshot wound. Additionally, a family of four in Georgetown also received Jones's call for revolutionary suicide. They were all members of the People's Temple and showed their unity to the group by cutting their own throats and dying. However, the People's Temple basketball team that had refused orders to return to Jonestown after a game survived. Three of Marceline and Jim Jones's sons, Stephen, Jim Jr., and Tim, were on that team. They were arrested and held for weeks during the investigation. Eventually, they were released and returned to the United States. The Jonestown bodies were flown back to Dover Air Force Base in Maryland to be identified. Given the advanced state of decomposition, that was extremely difficult, and over 400 individuals were either never identified or 
their remains were not claimed. They are buried in a mass grave in Oakland, California. Within weeks of the mass suicide, the People's Temple was no more. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Anne Liu is our producer, and Jada Williams is our associate producer. Story research and additional writings by Anne Liu, Will Christensen, and Jada Williams. Mix and sound design by Matt Dyson, Abigail Sullivan, and Aaron Bauman. Head of audio, Tom Monahan, with audio assistance from Masuzu Enaga. For Wondery, Stephanie Wachneen and Claire Chambers are producers, and Callum Plews is senior managing producer. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louis, Morgan Jones, and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. And last but not least, myself, Candace DeLong. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Hey, grown-ups! The Cat in the Hat cast is a new podcast from Wondery, perfect for the whole family. Join the Cat in the Hat and your favorite Dr. Seuss characters as they get whisked away on a new adventure every week. Fish dreams of creating his very own polite and quiet podcast. That is, until he gets a surprise visit to his fishbowl podcast studio from the Cat in the Hat himself. And it becomes very clear that the cat has other plans for the podcast. And those plans are the opposite of quiet. Sing along to new favorite songs, try your luck at Titanic tongue twisters, have some fun with wondrous wordplay, and most importantly, bring your family along for all of the adventures in the Cat in the Hat cast. Follow the Cat in the Hat cast on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to the Cat in the Hat cast early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Wondery Kids Plus on Apple Podcasts today.